What if everything you thought you knew about menopause was wrong? How would that change your perspective? Menopause, a transition in a woman's life that can bring about significant changes, can be a daunting experience. In this episode, we're going to explore the latest research, expert insights, and real-life stories to help you navigate this phase with confidence. So join us as we discuss how menopause affects women's physical, emotional, and mental health and discover practical tips and strategies to manage symptoms and improve your overall well-being. Whether you're going through menopause or supporting someone who is, this conversation is a must listen for anyone looking to demystify this transformative stage in a woman's life. This week's special guest is Dr. Mary Claire Haver, who is a board certified obstetrician, gynecologist and a certified culinary medicine specialist. She developed her groundbreaking weight loss protocol as an online subscriber program through which she has helped thousands of women lose weight, burn fat and get in shape permanently. It's now time to tune into this one very inspirational human being. Enjoy. Well, today or this afternoon, it just depends on which side of the world you are at today. We have a beautiful guest for you. We've got the lovely Dr. Mary Claire Haver. Welcome to the show. Thank you for having me. I almost thought I was going to misinterpret your name then. So the way that we love to start the show, we always love to ask our guests to share this story. So Mary Claire, tell us what inspired you to do what you do today? So I am a classically trained obstetrician gynecologist. Um, The training is very similar in our countries. In the U.S., we do uni, and then we do medical school, and then we go into our specialization. Um, And so I had done that for about 20 years and was very working at a big university hospital was super busy with, you know, delivering babies and taking care of my patients. I was also running the training program. I was one of the directors of the OBGYN, we call it residency here in the U S. And so, you know, when I reflect back on my own education and my own training, I'm super proud of it. You know, I learned so many amazing and wonderful things, but what I (laughs) realized once I went through perimenopause and menopause was there was a tremendous gap in the way we are training healthcare professionals in it. This is globally in taking care of women once they're past reproductive age. And so that was, you know, what started out for me was a struggle with my weight and more of my body composition. You know, I had gained some weight, but I was really starting to notice new, new fat deposits in my abdomen, in my midsection, where I had never really, you know, struggled before. And the old kind of tricks that I used to do, you know, the calories in, calories out, double down at the gym just stopped working for me. Now, my patients had been complaining of this over the years, and I would just, you know, very paternalistically tell them, oh, you know, just work out more, eat less. It's hard. I get it. You're exhausted. And, you know, just really not recognizing that this is a medical symptom of a condition that they're going through. So sadly, it had to take me going through it and suffering the same side effects. And my menopause symptoms were so severe. I thought like I was dying. Like I thought this can't be menopause. Like this, this is completely life disrupting and I should be able to breeze through this. I'm healthy. I'm fit. I, you know, how I eat right. I thought I ate right. Turns out maybe not so much. And you know, like what's wrong with me? And almost it was embarrassing that I felt like the need that I had to utilize hormone replacement therapy in order to feel like myself again. And so, you know, what started out for me as a journey into getting the excess weight and fat off a very, something I was not doing for health reasons, I really was doing it for vanity, just kind of brought me down a rabbit hole of the lack of education and, and training around healthcare professionals for menopausal women all the new studies that have come out in the last 22 years that have just kind of been brushed aside that we're really not doing our best for our age group as far as promoting our best our best health and wellness and there's so much misconception and shame and secrecy around this time of our lives and it really should not be that way so what started out for me as a journey for you know losing a few pounds <laughs> exploded into this menopause world and umbrella, and I've called myself proclaimed menopause warrior now. 
So I've totally changed my practice. I no longer do surgery or deliver babies. I just focus on care of the menopausal woman. I love that. And actually, before we were on the, uh, we came on the show, we were talking about the shame associated with menopause. And I know even for myself, my grandmother passed away in her 60s of breast cancer. And so even going on HIT, which I have done now, um, I remember the doctors were saying it's, 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 it's a bad idea mm-hmm. because, you know, it can enhance breast cancer, that kind of thing. But it's, I've not heard what you were saying before. It actually helps extend your life. Could you maybe unpack that a little bit? Sure. Um, So this was a surprise to me and I think to the researchers as well. There's been a few in the U.S. studies that were kind of done on women of our age. One was um, the SWAN study, um, and it was a study of women across the nation, S-W-A-N, and they tracked them through premenopause, perimenopause, postmenopause, and beyond, and looked at different health outcomes. Um, The second was the Women's Health Initiative, which was enacted by the National Institutes of Health to see if hormone replacement therapy would be helpful for cardiovascular disease. And so that was the study that across the world sounded this huge alarm that you you know breast cancer risk was increased and you know we're really harming women with hormone replacement therapy and so in those 22 years that study's pretty much been debunked it's been looked at again and you know the average age of women starting hormone replacement therapy was 63 and you know so there seems to be a timing hypothesis as to when you start hormone therapy in your menopause journey as far as health benefits so the national in in the US the American Heart Association went back and they looked at the data and and followed the women for like 20 something years and looked at heart disease and they said listen women who started hormone therapy in late perimenopause and early menopause. So somewhere in their late forties to early fifties and continued it for till about age 60, they actually have less cardiovascular disease versus women who did not and less death from cardiovascular disease. Also better quality of life, less osteoporosis. And it's looking like starting young for high risk individuals, less less Alzheimer's and dementia, less neurodegenerative disease. And that just absolutely you know, blew people away because we had just been taught this is so dangerous. So for the, in that study, remember the average woman was 63 years old. So we're not talking about 45 and 55 year old women starting hormone therapy. You know, this is a much older population, but in that study, you know, with the older women, the average, so for a woman between 45 and 55, her five-year risk of breast cancer is 2.3%. Okay. And when you add in estrogen and progesterone hormone replacement therapy, so the women who did estrogen only, who didn't have a uterus or had the IUD with progesterone, they had no increased risk of breast cancer over their baseline. When you added the estrogen and progesterone arm, the risk went from 2.3 to 2.9%. Okay. And so because of that percent, less than 1% increased risk overall, that basically for a generation of women disqualified them from even considering hormone replacement therapy. Now that is a 26% increase, but I mean, it just depends on how you spend the statistics and everything in in the press got overblown. It was on the big talk shows in the U S that this is dangerous. And like obstetricians and gynecologists who were practicing medicine at that time can tell you the day that study came was released and hit the newsstands because they were bombarded with phone calls of women terrified that they were going to get breast cancer. And the increased risk was actually very, very small over baseline. I love hearing that because I know even for myself, like I went from different doctors and then obviously uh, hormone therapists as well that specialize in that area because I was afraid. I even went to see a natural, uh, well, she she did a lot of work with co- compound pharmacy, so still doing HRT, but as natural as possible because of all the fear that was associated with HRT. Um, but I love to hear that because it has made a big difference. I know for myself, I thought I was going crazy. And I know mm. many women that go through menopause feel like they are losing control of their life. They're losing control of themselves. They behave in ways that they don't even recognize. Recognize, yeah. They yeah. don't recognize. So when, when, when a patient comes to me and she is wherever she is on her menopause journey and we w- walk lay out a plan together, you know, I say, listen, menopause care is a toolbox. 
And you can't just rely on one herb, one supplement, one, one prescription, you know, and expect to get your life back. You know, you, so much of you has changed. Every organ system in your body has gone through this disruption. The best thing I could ever do is transplant your 25 year old ovaries back into you, but no one's doing that. Okay. So hormone replacement therapy can do a lot, but you cannot go forward and expect to be your, in your best health unless you focus, you know, nutrition has got to be the first thing in your toolkit. Exercise has got to be the second thing. Pharmacology, hormonal and non-hormonal options, depending on your individual risk factors, which is an independent discussion between you and your healthcare provider. Number three, adequate sleep. If you're not sleeping, nothing's working, okay? And number four, um, possible supplementation. Supplements are meant to supplement a healthy diet. We don't swallow. I've actually got mine right here. <laughs> swallow a handful of supplements, expecting it to undo poor nutritional choices or poor lifestyle choices, and then stress reduction, you know, and all of those parts of the toolkit fit together. Now, I developed a nutrition program, Galveston Diet, you know, <laughs> my book, um, to help all women like get their heads wrapped around what they can do from a nutrition standpoint. And in my clinic, when patients come to see me, I'm able to really personalize that because I have a machine that will measure not only their weight, but which is to me is a terrible indicator of health, you know, but their body, their muscle mass and their body fat and where their fat is, what type it is. And so that really helps me, you know, and help a patient, in, you know, get to the nitty gritty of what we can do for her, you know, across the board. In her, during her menopause. That's amazing. So what what is that? Because I hear that all the time. Every time somebody hits their middle age, they say, I'm I'm I'm, I'm carrying an extra lot of little layers here <laughs> yeah. in the stomach. What creates so, that? Well, there's a there is a physiologic reason for the body changes that the majority of us will go through. So women are gaining weight about a pound and a pound and a half per year, regardless of their menopause status, okay, at about age 35. And that's they think. They um, experts believe that that's more due to aging than the hormonal changes. But when you layer menopause on, something special starts happening to our body composition, meaning where and how you store fat. We start losing muscle mass at an accelerated rate beginning in late perimenopause, and, and we start gaining new fat, especially in the midsection abdomen or what we call visceral fat at three times as high as it was in premenopause. So what's going on? Yes, the scale is going up, but that scale, remember, is is multiple things: your body water, your muscle mass, your fat mass, and so you're you're losing lean muscle, which controls your basal metabolic rate. So you're not. So people are like, I'm not doing anything different. Of course you're not. You have the same routine, right? But you're losing muscle mass. And you are gaining tremendous amount of fat. And so the fat being the intra-abdominal visceral fat is actually very, very pro-inflammatory. So in the body, we have two, two kind of compartments of fat. One is subcutaneous, and that's the fat we've known our whole lives. It gives us curves, cellulite. You can pinch it. In the US, we say pinch an inch. It was a commercial. You know, it's the fat under your skin. It is very, very um, sensitive to calories in, calories out. Visceral fat is different. This is the fat that is inside of our abdomen wrapping around our internal organs. And this fat is highly inflammatory. It pumps out cytokines, inflammatory mediators, and it puts you in this negative feedback cycle. You're losing muscle mass, gaining fat. That fat's making more inflammation. That inflammation is driving insulin resistance. Insulin resistance is driving more fat. I mean, you just end up in this horrible negative feedback cycle. So my job, you know, nutritionally and with Galveston diet is to use nutrition to try to undo that, <laughs> that traffic circle and have it spin the other way. So when you're talking about the uh, Galveston diet, what exactly is it? So, you know, it's a, it's a three prong program, all meant to act synergistically. All three actions act together to help lower inflammation. So I developed it, you know, out of frustration for my own weight gain and my patients and my girlfriends. And, you know, I, I first consulted the PhD nutrition scientist at the university I was employed at, and they kind of pointed me towards the elderly and inflammation. That's where most of the research being done. I said, well, we're not elderly yet. They said, well, you're on your way. So we know that from like 35 until 70, this cascade is happening. And so what can we do about it? Well, it turns out most of the interventions that you can do are not medication, they're nutrition for the chronic inflammation. And so I loved, there was some elegant research done on neuroinflammation, so Alzheimer's and dementia. 
and looking at fasting. So intermittent fasting is one of the tenets of our program. And, and then that can look like different things to different people. And certainly if you have an eating disorder or hypoglycemia, this part, you know, this tenet is something you have to be very careful with. Um, but for most women, they can do it safely and it, it has very little consequence as long as you ease into it. Um, but it does, it's a powerful lower of, it, lowers inflammation in a powerful way, lowers insulin levels, glucose levels. And most of my um, patients and followers and you know students in our program tell us that it's the easiest thing for them. Like it scared them the most. They were the most, you know, oh, I don't know about this. And then once they got used to it, it was really helpful. The second tenet is really looking at the quality of your nutrition, looking at foods that naturally flight inflammation, and then trying to avoid things that we know universally can promote inflammation in our diet. Mostly, um, and I'm not saying never that you can never have anything processed or, you know, I mean, we're all human. We all, I like French fries. Um, but, you know, just really the focus of your diet should be on fruits, vegetables, legumes, lean meats. I mean, it's not rocket science, but like me, I, I do a lot of teaching in the book and on our online program, explaining the science behind why that happens and what it does to your body. And that seems to help make those choices easier. And the last part of it, the third tenant is what we call fuel refocusing, where we look, we do a really deep dive into macro and micronutrients and looking at percentages, you know, what would be great, better for fat loss and then maintenance. And then I really love that, you know, the different micronutrients we focus on like fiber, magnesium, omega-3s. And I really do a lot of talk around the science of what's happening to your body in menopause and how making sure you're getting adequate amounts of these nutrients will, you know, through food mostly, but possible supplementation will make your menopause journey much healthier and easier. Oh, wow. And I love that. It's making me feel a little bit more confident because I feel that I've, um, I mean, I can really relate to the loss of muscle. I have, I think in probably in the last five years, every time I exercise, I injure myself because I can feel the difference between what my arms were, these little flabby bits, maybe like even like eight, 10 years ago to what they are now. And I'm always been quite fit, but my mm -hmm. body has definitely shifted in the way that I, I'm still agile, but when it comes to weight, I've strength. definitely, yeah, the strength in my muscles have disappeared. Do you see it's, that often? Yes. And so I, I can track it in my patients. Um, and, you know, I, I quite often I have to have a difficult conversation with a patient who is of normal weight. Her BMI is perfectly normal, body mass index. However, she has a tremendous amount of visceral fat and very low muscle mass. So the number on the scale looks fine, but she's not healthy. And so, you know, she's had her head wrapped around, you know, how many stone or, you know, whatever kilos she is. And, um, and I'm fine. I'm fine. And I'm like, there's so much more to our health than that number. You know, let's, let's break this down. And, and you're at risk for being frail in 10, 15 years and not being able to lift a grandbaby or a basketball or whatever you want to do, you know, whatever your goals are. But I mean, no, none of us want to be limited by our physical abilities at 70. Everybody wants to be that healthy, fun 70-year-old who's climbing mountains and opening doors and lifting things and can take care of herself, you know, and and so if you're starting to have low muscle mass in your 50s, if you don't put, you know, get adequate protein and do resistance training and do the things that you need to do, you're at risk for being frail and breaking. Like if you fall and break your hip, there's a 50% death rate in 5 years. Oh, wow. Yes. That's, you have an osteoporotic fracture of the hip. 50% yeah. of patients will pass away within five years from, you know, it just leads to this cascade of really, really tough things. And so knowing that, and I'd like to live longer, um, I, I have low muscle mass genetically. So I am just constantly battling to hang on to what I have and try to put on a little bit more. So, so your trick is doing resistant training. Mm -hmm. strength training at least two to three times a week and making sure I'm getting adequate protein. That's amazing. And also have you noticed, and I've, I've experienced this myself, but, but also I've noticed women the same age as me uh, cannot handle alcohol anymore. It impacts oh, them yeah. so dramatically. So I can, like I could have two drinks, three drinks, forget about it. And I'm, it takes me a week to recover. So mm -hmm. what creates, it's almost like a leave, almost our liver is not functioning as, as well as it used to. So a lot, some of that is to do with loss of muscle mass. So like the way your body metabolizes things is slowing down. Also, you know, we are having much more disrupted sleep at a baseline 
um, in, in menopause. There's something very, you know, it's the rare patient who doesn't complain of some type of sleep disruption or either they're having struggling to go to sleep or waking up. Usually it's middle of the night wake ups. And, um, and then when you add alcohol into that, I mean, that just, you know, we just can't process things like we used to. Mm, so true. So what do you, so I, and I know sleeping is a big one. So what do you recommend to those that do have those breaking sleeping patterns? Cause you hear about it. Like if you don't, and everyone experiences when you don't have a good night's sleep, you don't right. function. It's like you have the drunk right. brain. And your cortisol levels are high and all of that, all of that is true. So when someone comes in and they're chronically struggling, the first conversation we have, and we, I have blogs about this on our website is sleep hygiene. Like sleep medicine specialists will talk to you about setting yourself up for successful sleep, the temperature of the room, comfortable sheets, pillows, distractions off. This is my problem. This, my cell phone. You know, I have my Kindle loaded on my cell phone so I can read at night, not wake up my husband. But now we've agreed to get Kindles just for the bed and we go charge our phones in the bathroom so that you're not tempted, you know, to, and we don't watch television in our bedroom, you know, like just setting up your environment for sleep. Um, and especially we're seeing so much more disrupted sleep with people taking their phones to bed. Um, and, you know, if a patient isn't willing to give up her phone at night, I'm kind of like, that's, you know, something I'm, I'm going to have a hard time helping you with. So sleep hygiene is one. The second is, you know, there are supplements that, you know, magnesium l um, is a specific type of magnesium that crosses, crosses the blood brain barrier the best. Um, and so it has been really helpful for some patients for sleep. Um, I don't recommend other than very short-term use of any sleep aids. They're addictive. They have long-term consequences, um, sleepwalking, amnesia, all of that, you know, for very short-term use for very specific circumstances, of course, yes. But for, you know, chronic sleep issues, absolutely not. Nothing that is um, a benzodiazepine would be appropriate um, for, for my patients. And then hormone replacement therapy, estrogen. If you're having disrupted sleep because of low estrogen levels and hot flashes and night sweats, this is a miracle lifesaver for many, many women. And so I, because I have a uterus still have to take progesterone as well as estrogen to protect to the lining of my uterus. And so I take my progestin at night, I do it orally, and that seems to help with sleep as well. Wow, that's amazing. I do. I have done all of those things. I have red light, so I'm I'm, my, I'm not distracted. My brain is not distracted with the blue light. I mm. also make sure the room is at 18 degrees, so it's very mm. cool. Um, and if I do have problem uh, sleeping, I take sometimes I do magnesium every single night. I do magnesium and turmeric, but then I also, uh, if I have a little bit of uh, trouble sleeping, I might take a little bit of melatonin, but not too much because that can also yeah. give me a really big headache. Um, melatonin. Sometimes people complain of a hangover. It can be really mm -hmm. helpful, for, especially if you're traveling time zones. So you know, my husband uh, used to work in Kazakhstan, so he had monthly long plane flights. So melatonin was part of his, you know, two to three days. You start taking melatonin to start helping to reset your clock. Um, and um, there was one other. Oh, occasionally I might take like Tylenol PM in the US. It's a acetaminophen plus Benadryl. So just a mild sedative, but I don't do it very often. I don't want to become dependent on it. Yeah. Okay. And what about headaches? I hear women talk about migraines and headaches once they hit menopause. What's that about? So there is there is the rare organ system that is not affected by menopause. And each of us, even a twin is going to have a very unique menopausal journey. So it's not your mom's menopause. You're half your, you got half the genes from someone else. And so, you know, everything from the brain, your skin, your gut, your, you know, dry skin, dry eyes, dry mouth, dry teeth, you know, everything dries up, um, your genital urinary system. So the estrogen is a powerful anti-inflammatory hormone. And um, estrogen withdrawal for a lot of women leads to migraines. I have multiple patients who say that their migraines are much better on hormone replacement therapy, especially continuous dosing. So yeah. even if you had menstrual migraine headaches, you know, even if you had migraine with aura, you might still be a candidate for hormone therapy, but it needs to be transdermal to decrease the risk of clots. So, um, 
So don't just think that you're not going to be a candidate for hormone therapy because you have mm. migraines or because you have, you know, a history of something, you might still qualify. Yeah. And what are your thoughts around testosterone? Um, so I use it. So the, the studies that support its use clearly are for hypoactive sexual desire disorder that were done in menopausal women. And so I use it for that. I also use it off label. Um, they're doing studies now for patients I told you about. It's a, the, the low muscle mass sarcopenia. So if I have a patient who is coming in with very low muscle mass and we're both worried about her frailty in the future, I suggest adding testosterone to her, you know, regimen in order to hopefully with with uh, resistance training and protein intake using a little testosterone to help her gain some muscle mass or hang on to the muscle she has mm. um now other study they, they're you know in the u.s there are these companies who are making all these claims about testosterone they're also selling these pellets in different ways to inject it in your system but there's not randomized controlled studies and i'm really evidence-based the way i you know i'm not gonna just if i say it's my opinion i'm gonna say it you know, but, and, and some of my patients that said, yeah, I feel like it helped me with X, Y, and Z, but we don't have a clear indication for that. I just tell them Sally down the street might say that it cured her whatever, you know, but the only thing we know that clearly it can't, it might, it's not even a, you know, hundred percent is, is your, what in the libido or the sexual desire. Yeah. Okay. The reason I was asking that is that's, that's another thing that I've also, including myself, when I had my bloods done, um, I was low in testosterone and mm -hmm. it's definitely made me feel, it's given me a little bit of a kick to my walk, right? A little bit of a boost when I'm, I have, I feel like I'm not so sluggish in energy. I have a lot more energy, um, but it's only a short time. It's only been a very short time for me to really so say it's life changing. A hundred percent of women outside of having a tumor are going to be low in testosterone um, in menopause. I mean, it's made in the same factory. 50% of it is made in the adrenal, 50% in the ovary. And the ovary shut down, your testosterone production shuts down there. So it, it's going to be low. And so do we, there's not enough evidence to support a blanket re giving everyone testosterone. I would love to see more studies. What makes me sad in the US is these companies who are making billions of dollars selling this testosterone aren't reinvesting it in any studies on women. So I think they're scared that they won't show a difference. <laughs> and then the FDA, and they're not approved by the Food and Drug Administration here in the US. So you have to pay out of pocket. It's not covered by insurance. You know, it becomes an elitist thing. So it's a it's tough one. It's very expensive. I mean, I, go, I get mine through the compound pharmacy, but still mm -hmm. very, very, very it's still expensive. expensive. Yeah. yeah, absolutely. And what about bone density? Because I know there's also women that, are now getting like they get their uh, um, their scans done, and mm -hmm. some are even getting inject like injections because of low density into their bones. Have you heard? Oh, that? that's yeah. new to me. Yeah, no, they do that in Australia. They there's uh, and I know a couple of people. That so are there's doing some that. IV therapy, like people will go in once a month and get. But I didn't know about anything into the bones. I have to look into that. In the US, typically, if you're di diagnosed with osteopenia or osteoporosis then there's a few different classes of medications. Basically, it slows down the bone turnover, so you hang on to it more. Um, things like in the U.S., Fosamax and Raloxifene. And and, um, and then there's Boniva, which is injectable. Like um, you get an IV once a, once a year, maybe. Um, so there's different options depending on, you know, tolerance and risk. Um, also collagen, there's a great study that came out um, that showed there's something called Fortibone, a very specific type of collagen that was given to women who with osteoporosis, who were postmenopausal, and they showed improvement in their bone density scores. And it took two years, but, you know, collagen supplementation can do a lot um, yeah. there as well. Yeah, because I hear that all the time that... I I reckon every second woman that I uh, have spoken to that is currently experiencing menopause have got osteopenia. I'm just thinking maybe that's just normal. There's nothing wrong with you. That's just part of us evolving, let's say. Um, so in the U.S., we don't test till 65, which is kind of sad, though. You know, most of the orthopedists who work with menopausal women are say, just pay out of pocket, go and have it done younger. Um, but they, right now it's not, it's not covered routinely until you're 65, unless you have a family history or, or, or some kind of disorder that would put you at higher risk. But I have patients coming to me, tons who 
have osteopenia and osteoporosis. And we are, you know, we start resistance training, protein, you know, all the things. Um, turns out calcium, oral calcium supplementation is not that helpful, actually might be harmful on the cardiovascular disease side. So like foods rich in calcium are going to be your best bet more than just taking calcium yeah. supplements. Yeah, absolutely. And you also mentioned about skin drying out, your hair mm -hmm. drying out. So how do we attend to that? Because I know we've all experienced it. So what's your trick? So um, the younger, you know, if hormone therapy is an option for you, starting young seems to attenuate that. But I mean, you, we just have to change our skin routines. You know, we have to use more emollients. We have to use more protection. Um, I know most of you guys are very good about sunscreen because the skin cancer rate is astronomical. Um, but that's kind of a trade off for um, low vitamin D levels, which is also linked to osteoporosis. So you stay out of the sun, you know, there's risks and benefits to everything. Um, and so for skin, you know, once it's dry, you're going to struggle with that probably forever. And so just finding a good, you know, skincare routine where you're not leaching natural oils from the skin and you're trying to keep it protected, keep it covered, keep it moisturized is going to be your best bet. Mm, yeah. It's funny. We were talking about that the other day. I remember in my teens, we used to put baby oil. I don't know if you know what baby oil oh, is on the skin. Same. It's a sun bake. That could be, yeah, we call it tanning. Yes, yeah. I know. It's like oh, and these anything, days, baby oil like, and iodine or something, anything to make us look tanner. Oh, my yeah, gosh. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I know. We start, like, lap it on the skin. And these days, we're like, mm. we have to make sure it's got zinc in it and it's, you know, it's oh yeah, 50 plus protection and so funny. Hat, yeah. sunglasses. I look like I look like a beekeeper. <laughs> yeah. yeah, yeah. You look amazing. Absolutely amazing. Oh, you really thank you. Do. You were talking about intimate uh fasting and i think that's a that's a, another thing like i've heard different stories it's not good for us <laughs> yeah and then i've heard it's actually good for us and you know i think it's look and i've tried it myself well i'll say okay i'll stop eating come seven o'clock no more food until 10 or 11 o'clock the next day or i try to stretch it out i have to say when i stretch it out to 16 hours i have felt amazing mm-hmm so the studies that I use to support recommending it in the book are all based on a 16-8. It's, you know, I, I tried to focus on studies for the book that were done in women, done in women in middle age and hopefully menopausal. And so um, I don't like studies done on 25-year-old male athletes. And so Dr. Mark Matson, who was with the NIH, he was doing the Alzheimer's and dementia research. So his patients were older. So I really liked his... So that's kind of the window I shot for was that 16, eight. That seems to be at hour 12 is when the benefits begin. When the autography starts, autophagy starts happening, that's when we start chewing up our junk proteins and kind of cleaning out everything in our cells, you know, getting rid of the junk. Also your insulin, your fasting insulin levels, then you start, start declining your glucose levels go down, but not to a dangerous rate. And um, now one adv advice that I give my students is that take it slow. It took me six weeks to become fasting adapted. And I was a morning exerciser. And the first thing I did was have coffee with all kind of additives in it to make it taste fine. So the first thing I did was learn how to drink my coffee black, which I swore I would never do. I used to travel with a little zippy, a little plastic bag full of my particular sweetener that I liked for my coffee because I wanted my coffee the way I wanted it. And so then when I read all the research, I was like, okay, how am I going to do this? I mean, I was sweating, you know, so I just kind of weaned myself off of the additives of the coffee over a couple of weeks till I went black and I had to white knuckle it for about two weeks and then it was totally fine. And that's five years ago and I haven't looked back. And so then I started pushing out my, my eating window when I broke my fast in like 15 minute increments. So 715 one day, and then that felt fine. I do that for three or four days. Then I go to 730 then do that for four or five days, then go to 745. And by just stepping it out slowly and letting my body adjust to this new eating window, it really was not a huge disruption to my blood glucose. I was never starving. I felt absolutely fine. That's amazing. When you were saying that, I also, for me, the other transition that I currently experience as well is coffee. I can't drink coffee anymore because it gives me anxiety. Ah, okay. Okay. Yeah. I've, so, I've heard of that as well, but not me yet. <laughs> No, you're so lucky. So <laughs> what would create that? Like what would, because um, I know there's, look, that, I guess that's part of menopause. A lot of women do experience 
uh, anxiety and depression. And I don't know. Yes. So mental health. Yeah. Yeah. When we talk about brain, I mean, from sleep to everything in mental health, ADHD is much more likely to be newly diagnosed, um, worsening depression. Now, interestingly enough, when no one is recommending hormone therapy for primary treatment of depression, but it's definitely helpful with an SSRI. Women on hormone therapy and their antidepressant do better than without the hormone therapy. And starting in late perimenopause, you can not develop, you know, the new onset risk of depression goes down as well. Like there's so much new research coming out for mental health as, you know, in support of hormone therapy. Because that's what happened to me when I first started, they put me on, uh, they tried me on antidepressants because it started off with anxiety and which was associated with when I had my bloods done that I had, uh, I was uh, heading towards menopause. Um, yeah. I couldn't take them. I was off my head every time I took any of the tablets they gave me. And the only thing that really worked for me was um, uh, the HRT. So it was interesting because a lot of other women around the same age group were saying that they were put on antidepressants, but not HRT because of the danger associated with HRT. Right. Same thing in the US. So from age 20 to age 45, the risk of a woman being placed on, now there's on an antidepressant. Now I'm not trying to trash antidepressants. It's an important medication. It is very much needed goes up like 400%. Like it's one, uh, yeah, like like a woman is four times more likely to be on an antidepressant in her forties than in her twenties. And like, why is that mental health just like rampant in our forties? No, we're going through the changes associated with menopause and doctors are scared to give hormone therapy. And so they're just like trying to blanket treat menopause with an SSRI. Now, Hot flashes do get better with certain SSRIs. Yes, um, we, you know, mental health disorders can get better with an SSRI, but you know, we're not treating the problem. We're not treating the menopause. You know, we're just giving her something, and and so I I can't believe that four times as many women are depressed and need an antidepressant. You know, when really they just needed some hormone therapy for their menopause. Hundred percent, and there's different ways. Like I, as I was explaining uh, initially, that I started with um, the uh, um, hormone replacement therapy from Compound Pharmacy, but there's so many different things out there. Like even like with the patches, and you said mm-hmm. something about the rod too. I know that there's different. So really, how do you know which one works with like for you with your patients? Do you just so, get, is this a trial and error? There's a little bit of trial and error. I tend to stick with the FDA approved regulated form. So in the US, that would be the pill, the patch, things that are made in a big pharmacy that the Food and Drug Administration here manages and makes sure what they say is in it is in it and they pass all their testing and studies. Compounding is not subject to that and is treated as a supplement. So no one is doing third party testing or managing. Now I use a count, you know, we all need a compounder for something occasionally. It, It should be occasional. When what you've got commercially available and is covered by insurance and affordable to the patient, you just cannot, you need a workaround. Of course, I'll go to a compounder. We'll try to to do some trial and error. But my go-to is an FDA approved version um, because it's much less expensive and it's beautiful, efficacious, and very, very safe. Yeah. 100%. 100%. Great. Thank you so much for answering that question. So let's unpack your book a little bit and uh, and then we'll all, we'll go to our three shiny golden nuggets. So what are our uh, tribe going to get out of your book? Because I know that you have also a tracker they can download. So maybe yeah. maybe unpack that a little bit. So um, I don't know. Are they going to be able to yeah. see this guy? Yes, of course. Yes. So there are two versions. So if any of you guys follow me on social media, this is the book in the US. It's blue. Okay. This is the book in Australia and the UK. <laughs> and it's not my fault. This was the publisher's decision to change the cover. So, and there are, I had no idea this would exist in my first book ever. There are pirated versions. There are fake versions. So make sure that not only is my name as the author on the book, but also in the text when you like go on Amazon or, or wherever the links are in the UK. I mean, in Australia where you can buy it. And so, um, so the book is got meal plans, recipes, but it's also an introduction into menopause. 
It's also the story of menopause and what's happening with you nutritionally and your body composition changes and what's happening hormonally. And what I try to do as much education as I could. And then it goes into nutrition and how it can help and meal plans and lists and, you know, lots of great things. Um, I love tracking. I don't think it's for everyone. It can cause neuroses in some people, but I, I talk about my favorite tracker, which is available worldwide. It's online. And so, and it's the one, my daughter is a nutrition science major. Um, she's graduating from university in this May and she's going on to medical school in the U S. Um, so she holds me accountable. <laughs> So much. Like she can't wait to find an article to negate something. I love her and I'm so proud of her, but you know, our kids drive us crazy. And so um, she recommended this tracker because it's the one they used in her nutrition program. So I talk about it in the book. It's called Chronometer, and you can just Google it and find it, but it'll help you track your nutrition, how much fiber are you getting, how you know, how much omega, what's your calcium, what's your magnesium at, you know, to help you stay healthier that way. That's amazing. It's amazing. So obviously you were saying excuse me, all your clients, you actually assess them with a machine. What about- In my clinic, yeah. In your clinic. So what about uh, if somebody wants to reach out to you from Australia, let's say, which they will. So yeah. Um, so there, you know, there's a there's an easy way to kind of estimate if you have visceral fat and it's called the waist hip ratio. So you simply divide the smallest part of your waist, wherever that is on your body. And if you go out, that's fine. Just pick your belly button. If you don't have an in- <laughs> if you go out, it's no problem. Just pick the same spot that you're going to be able to measure again because you want to see a difference. And then you're going to pick the widest part of your hips around your backside. So wherever you are the widest, and you're going to divide those two numbers. And it's going to be waist divided by the hip number. And so if you are less than a 0.7, okay, in centimeters, so you do centimeters and centimeters. If you're less than a 0.7, you most likely don't have a lot of visceral fat, and that's not going to be an issue for you. If you are greater than point than one, if your waist is bigger than your hips, then most likely you do have excessive visceral fat, and that puts you in a special risk category. So I can't measure everyone or weigh, and our students, we have 100,000 students enrolled in the online program, so we use the waist hip ratio as a non-scale measurement, you know, so that they can track their progress. That's easy, super easy. Thank you for that. And mm -hmm. as we start wrapping up the show, we always love to ask our guests to leave three shiny golden nuggets or three hot tips. And what would be those three practical exercises that you'd like to leave for our audience? So one of the things, if you do nothing else, is you should know how much fiber you're getting in your diet. Um, and I reckon and 25 grams per day is the this it's higher for men, but 25 grams per day for a woman is the recommended daily amount. Most of us only get half of that. So like paying attention to that and then seeing what you're getting in your normal diet and then increasing foods rich in fiber is going to go such a long way for your health. Number two, you need to advocate for yourself. Um, educate yourself. I have lots of resources that are absolutely applicable. Um, in Australia, at our website at galvestondiet.com, if you go to our blogs, I have tips on how to advocate for yourself at your doctor's office. I have lots of, you know, quizzes. I have, you know, different foods that can help with hot flashes that, you know, if you're not a candidate for hormones, then I have lots of nutritional information available all for free on our website. And number three, you know, the Australasian Menopause Society is excellent. They have a fabulous website. They have so many resources. Start there. You know, this is a group of healthcare professionals who are devoted to menopause care. And they have so much great information, you know, specifically developed for your area, you know, for you guys, for your area of the world. And they have a, like a pair my perimenopause quiz comes directly from them, from their information. Um, they have a scoring system to see if you're in perimenopause based on your symptoms. And so, you know, such a beautiful resource. And I think really a lot of people don't know about it and it's really underutilized. Amazing. Thank you so much. So where is the best place for our tribe to find you? Oh, galvestondiet.com at our okay. website. But I am I have a very large following on TikTok. Um, I'm Dr. Mary Claire, D-R-M-A-R-Y-C-L-A-R-E on TikTok and Instagram. Those are my two kind of bigger accounts. Um, I have a big following on Facebook, uh, about 250,000. 
uh, Mary Claire Haver. And we have our longer videos are on YouTube as well, where I just, I just dive into so many informational topics around menopause and nutrition. And that is again, the Galveston diet, Mary Claire Haver, MD. We'll have all of those in the show notes. I can't thank you enough. As I was saying before we got on the show, I got so excited when I saw that <laughs> we're going to have a doctor talking about menopause because that's kind of the buzzword at the moment. There's not enough people educating us on menopause. Yeah. Agree. Agree. So thank you so much for oh, your you're time, welcome. your energy so and sharing your wealth of wisdom. Thank, thank you for you. having me.